So we'll, we'll welcome again. So before proceeding to the next uh, talk, so, so there is one question by Mr. Uh, Anirban Chakravarti. So the question is, what exactly does the statement separable biological actions from somnogenic actions of SRS mean? So this is one of the uh, criteria for any endogenous, any endogenous substances to be labeled as sleep regulating substances. So it means that the somnogenic action of that particular substance should be uh, very specific to either to the inducing of the sleep or to that of the maintenance maintenance of the uh, uh, maintenance of the sleep, and that particular mechanism should not be associated with any other physiological or the biological functions in case if that particular somnogen is uh, inducing it. Say for example, uh, say we say GH on it, growth hormone regulating hormone is also we uh, what one of the uh, sleep regulatory you know the substances, but otherwise. GHRH is also in, involved in many other physiological functions, but the pathway in which the GR, GHRH induces or it plays an important role in, in inducing the sleep is very specific to sleep, but it is not associated with any other physiological functions. So this is the meaning of so separable biological actions from somnogenic actions of SRS. So that the sleep inducing or the sleep maintenance function should be entirely different and it should not be uh, or very specific to inducing or to the maintenance of the sleep. So now we we'll proceed to, to trying to understand the uh, neurophysiology of uh, sleep. <clears throat> so when it comes to the trying to understand the neurophysiology of sleep. So uh, we know that the sleep has been no further has been categorized into, uh, as I told you, that we, uh, between NREM sleep and that of REM sleep. And uh, the nomenclature that is used to uh, label these different uh, stages of sleep. Uh, is what we follow now is the ASSM uh, criteria. So earlier, okay, there was the another criteria, which is called as RNK, that is Rishkafen and Kale's, you know, the uh, classification of uh, sleep stages. Now, so both ASSM and RNK, though there is not much uh, difference, but the only, the major, you know, the difference uh, to, grossly classify the sleep was the S3 and S4, that is the deep sleep state in the RNK has been combined as a single stage, that is stage N3 in uh, ASSM, you know, the criteria. In the RNK criteria, we used to tell REM, uh, REM sleep stage. Now we, uh, you know, just label it as, you know, the stage R. So, so for now, in all the uh, deliberations, so we'll be using the terminology as stage W, which stands for the wake. And in NREM sleep stages is N1, N2, and N3. And where N3 is the combination of both S3 and S4 in RNK classification, or in the layman terminology, where N3 is also called as deep sleep state, and R is the REM sleep state. Now, how do we uh, the, classify these uh, different uh, sleep stages? So you know that is dependent on the recordings of the polysomnography, where we have to record EEG, uh, uh, electroculogram that is EOG, EMG, that is electromyogram. And based on the different waveform uh, that is present, it is classified into wake, N1, N2, N3, and REM sleep. And uh, the in detail of these things, so uh, we can, uh, uh, we have a very detailed session uh, 
on how to classify, how to identify these waves uh, in our uh, tomorrow's uh, session. So, however, for for this particular presentation, so it is for just for you to give the glimpse that how the sleep is classified. That is, if in a given epoch or epoch is around 30 seconds, if our alpha wave is say more than 50% of an epoch, we classify it as wake. And as alpha reduces, right, and uh, these, uh, uh, you can see these eye, ro eye rolling movements. And when compared to wake, if EMG is, raised, uh, is less, we classify it as N1. And the hallmark of any of the sleep, especially at the stage two, is the occurrence of the sleep spindle and also that of the K-complex. And then as the sleep progresses to the deeper, that is the deep sleep state. So we know that uh, these EEG waves, it becomes of a high amplitude and low frequency. So it becomes more and more delta uh, in, uh, at the delta frequency range and we call it as the deep sleep state. And then we get the REM sleep, where in the REM sleep, so we call it, uh, we know that REM sleep is called as paradoxical sleep uh, for the reason that uh, you, if you take an EEG of a wake EEG and uh, it will be almost similar, uh, sorry, the REM sleep EEG will be almost similar to that of a wake uh, EEG, even though person is in uh, sleep. So therefore, by looking at just at an EEG, it will be very difficult to distinguish whether the person is in REM sleep or in the uh, wake state. Therefore, EOG and EMG plays a very important role where we can see the uh, rapid eye movements and where EMG uh, will be uh, hypertonic or completely atonic, right? And we classify this as REM sleep. Now, so we'll, with this brief understanding, we'll try to understand the basic, you know, the physiology that is, uh, um, that is uh, physiology behind how these, uh, the uh, EEG waves, you know, are generated and what are the different networks of the neural network that are uh, associated in generating with this, uh, uh, with this EEG. Uh, so before going further, it is also worth to know that uh, the when you look at the hypnogram, the first half of the hypnogram, right? Uh, so we see uh, we spend more time in the deep sleep state, and in the second half we spend more in the uh, REM sleep state. And I, in, I with my previous presentation, now it could be very clear for you that the amount of N3 is will be proportionate to the homeostatic. Uh, pressure that is present or, or the build of or the sleep pressure that is built up. So, and where uh, the sleep regulatory substances, you know, it plays a very, very important role. And so we know that uh, the cycle of wake to NREM sleep and REM sleep, so it is uh, happens for the uh, one sleep cycle and such four to five sleep cycles plays a very uh, important role. Uh, in in a, to uh, to qualify a sleep as a a, a good uh, sleep in a healthy uh, individual, so where we need four to five such sleep cycles. So throughout the nocturnal sleep, so we spend more time in NREM sleep and twenty to twenty five percent in REM sleep, and among uh, in NREM sleep, right, more than fifty or, or nearly around fifty percent is spent in uh, N two and uh, around 25% in N3. Of course, the uh, N3, you know, it varies with the age. So with aging, uh, so what happens is that, so N3 gradually it start uh, reducing and there is an increase in the sleep onset. So where you can, you can see over here is that the person, uh, the old age person, when he goes to sleep, but he takes more time, you know, to get into sleep. So this is called a sleep onset latency. So it goes on increasing. And also we have a lot of intermittent awakenings with the, uh, uh, with the uh, aging and uh, where these two is uh, one of the uh, determines, which determines about the sleep quality. So therefore there is, there is also reduced sleep quality with aging 
because of the various factors. One of the important factor is there is the inter increase in the intermittent awakenings. So we'll try to see that why, you know, these, uh, uh, what is the physiology behind, you know, all, all these things. So by this time, so it's, it should be very clear to us, the sleep is not an output of a unitary process, but it is a resultant of the complex interaction between the various physiological process, you know, that is happening, starting from temperature to endocrine, to cerebral activity, to our respiratory cardiovascular and autonomic, you know, this activity. Now, and, and as such, there is no, uh, there is no one area of the brain which where we can say, okay, this is the area of the brain which is associated with the sleep. No, all the, most of the areas of the brain, you now they interact with each other, right? To, and they have a very specific role to play uh, in, uh, in the, in the uh, sleep initiation and in the sleep maintenance and various psychophysiological factors and phenomenology of uh, sleep, you know, is concerned. So the whole brain, you know, is involved in, the, in, in generating the sleep. So again, coming back to the, uh, the reticular, you know, this activating system, so which uh, was uh, told you in the last uh, uh, lecture. So, so we have the uh, cholinergic system, so which acts via thalamus, activates the foreprim, and monominergic, you know, it acts via hypothalamus, and we have uh, VLPO, which is the sleep promoting uh, neurons. And the other important thing here is the, uh, the from behavioral perspective, whether we are in the wake or in the sleep, the sustenance of that behavior is very, very important. Whenever we are in the wake state, sleep should not pathologically intrude into the wake, or if we are in the sleep state, they, the wake should not you know, intrude into a sleep state. So there should be a stable behavioral state at any given point of time. So as far as the wake is concerned, so what is the mechanism by which a stable wake is maintained? So we know now by all these nuclear groups, tubromammary nucleus, raphe nucleus, locus ceruleus, uh, lateral tegment, uh, 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 LDT and PPT, so all these things are wake promoting, but the stability of the activity of these wake promoting neuron is maintained by the orexinergic system. So orexin is one plays a very important role to maintain the right the stability of all the wake promoting uh, the neuronal group and where the orexin acts on these wake promoting neurons with the different receptors. So orexinergic one receptor acts in through LDT and PPT, one and two on raphe nucleus and orexinergic two with the tubular mammillary uh, nucleus. So this the tonic discharge of the orexin and its activity or its excitation for these wake promoting neurons, okay, will induce a stable wake. So ascending reticular activating system, which uh, I showed you earlier where it activates the forebrain right, to, to uh, induce the wake and in turn the orexin, it helps into the maintenance of the uh, wake. Further, the, the activity of this orexinergic, it also uh, plays a very important role in integrating both the homeostatic and, and also the circadian and also the behavior that are associated with these two Right, especially with the feeding uh, behavior and also with that of these emotions. So therefore, these orexin plays a very important role, right, in both the wake and also especially with the maintenance of the stable wake. And also, this also I showed you earlier, that is where ventrolateral preoptic area, uh, which, uh, which is highly gavargic in nature, and it inhibits the further, you know, the wake uh, promoting uh, neuronal groups, and, and by uh, inhibiting the uh, wake promoting neuronal group, it uh, helps to uh, maintenance of uh, the uh, sleep. So this whole interaction between these wake promoting and the sleep promoting neuronal group is being uh, given in the form of a circuit, which is called as flip-flop circuit, the, where uh, the 
the inspiration for this flip flop circuit was taken from the basic electronics where which tells uh, which tells that at any given point of time you know that one particular uh, behavioral state or one particular activity should be sustained so if you can see over here so we have vlpo now this ventrolateral preoptic area is further divided into two two groups right the vlpo ventrolateral uh, preoptic area that is core and the extended ventrolateral preoptic area that is at the periphery now the peripheral ventrolateral preoptic area is what that plays a very important role in generating of rem sleep and the core vlpo is what that is helps in the generating of that of a nrem uh, nrem sleep then here we have the uh, wake promoting uh, neurons uh, tuberous memory nucleus locus ceruleus dorsal raphe uh, you know, all these things now these two uh, neuronal groups that is wake promoting and the sleep promoting neuronal groups right they are mutually inhibitory to each, each other that is to say that whenever we are in the wake behavioral state these wake promoting neurons they inhibit the sleep promoting neurons so that the wake is you know the sustained and also in uh, during wake the orexinergic neurons you know it maintains the wake by being uh, uh, making these wake promoting neurons to be tonically active on the other hand whenever we get into sleep mode these sleep promoting neurons it inhibits the wake promoting neurons so that sleep is also you know sleep is also maintained and among the wake promoting neurons two important thing is ppt and ldt this is the one that is active in both during wake and also during that of a uh, during uh, the rem sleep right okay so during uh, uh, wake right so uh, because it uh, inhibits the uh, sleep promoting neurons so there uh, the and the rem sleep you know it is not uh, initiated so this uh, a delicate balance between wake promoting and sleep promoting uh, neurons is very very important to maintain a stable behavioral state so this particular flip flop circuit is a bistable and it uh, the stability is maintained by the uh, feedback and the activity of uh, sleep promoting and the wake promoting neurons they they reinforce okay the uh, each other and because of this they it avoids the inter, uh, what uh, intermediate states now what do you mean by intermediate states is that where the sleep pathologically when it intrudes uh, the uh, wake or whenever the wake you know is uh, uh, interferes with the stable uh, sleep so so in some of the neurodegenerative conditions when there is a degeneration of orexinergic uh, neuron neuronal growth the tonic activity or the influence of orexin on the wake is reduced so the stable wake is not maintained or the wake becomes very very unstable when wake becomes unstable the inhibitory effect of this wake on the sleep a promoting neurons becomes weak so that and so there will be a disinhibition of uh, of uh, sleep promoting neurons so sleep promoting neurons you know it, it becomes active and when this becomes active it pathologically intrudes into the wake so this is one of the hallmark of narcolepsy so orexin loss okay uh, which uh, brings about instability in uh, sleep and because of this instability why we call it as instability in the sleep is because sleep pathologically it intrudes into the wake which is one of the hallmark of uh, you know this narcolepsy so so to maintain this particular uh, you know this whole uh, circuit in a very delicate balance so this orexin plays a very very uh, important uh, role now so coming back to trying to understand as i uh, uh, as it was told that uh, um, the sleep is been scored based on the various uh, eeg waveforms or the eeg activity you know that comes now trying uh, so we shall try to understand how uh, the basically these uh, eeg waves you know is, is generated now 
this is because of the interaction of thalamocortical oscillations so this where you'll give a just a very rough understanding of thalamocortical oscillations so we have the cortex and in the reticular nucleus of the thalamus and the and the thalamocortical cells so information that comes from the periphery from the thalamocortical cells it goes to the cortex and the efferent copy of the same will goes to the reticular nucleus also and the processed information from the cortex it goes comes back to the thalamocortical cells and the efferent <coughs> copy of that will also goes to the reticular nucleus so here we have the reticular nucleus which is the shell of the thalamic group right which is in a position where it is receiving both the raw information coming from the periphery of the sensory information and also the process inform information based on and and where it compares this and in turn this will modulate the thalamocortical cells so so this is the very basic understanding how uh, where the thalamocortical network and where the reticular nucleus which is again more and more which is gabargic in nature which will how it modulates the thalamocortical cells so and also reticular nucleus is also known as spindle pacemaker where the intrinsic uh, activity of this uh, reticular uh, cells of thalamus so is at the frequency of the spindle so that's why it is called a spindle pacemaker and when it bombards what thalamocortical cells right and uh, the calcium spikes are generated and the calcium spikes when it goes to the cortex this is what it is recorded as the sleep spindle and which is one of the hallmark of uh, stage n2 and as there is a progressive hyperpolarization of this particular circuitry right the then the eeg waves it becomes more and more uh, less frequent and high, high amplitude where there will be transition from the spindle to towards theta and delta range and more into delta range where the deep sleep is initiated so having uh, understood about the flip flop circuit and how the uh, the thalamo the basics of how eeg is generated so as we know that the whole the whole sleep is also an ultradian in nature that is uh, what it mean what does it mean it means that there is a alteration of both uh, Uh, not only about wake and sleep but also it is between rem sleep and nrem sleep so as there is a circuit or the between uh, initiating of the wake and sleep there is also a circuit right which initiates rem sleep and which inhibits rem sleep so 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 the nuclear groups you now that uh, generates rem sleep is different and nuclear groups that are associated with the wake so they are different except for ppt ldt which share the common you know the function so even the nuclear groups that generate rem sleep is categorized into rem on neurons and rem off neurons and the rem rem on neurons are ppt ldt pre cerulius sublateral dorsal nucleus rem off neurons are rafe right the locus cerulius peri periaqueductal gray and lateral pontine you no know, this uh, uh, tegmentum now the what is also a difference between the uh, nrem sleep and the rem sleep or or what is the difference between the wake and also the uh, rem sleep the when you compare to the wake and also with that of a rem sleep now both are very highly active state there is no doubt but the stimulus for this high activity during rem sleep is entirely an endogenous input that is coming up but during the wake it is predominantly it is driven by the external input for the high activity of uh, uh, of the uh, neural network and during rem sleep you now this fore brain is very cholinergically which is very uh, active and uh, and uh, aminergically it is very demodulated so this particular model it is called as aim model that is high activation uh, of for rem sleep and where the input is entirely you know uh, internal and uh, and uh, where the fore brain where it is cholinergically very active and uh, and it is demodulated by aminergically now this 
differential activity of the forebrain during REM sleep with cholinergic and aminergic, this is what plays a very important role in dream mentation and or the uh, illusion or the hallucinatory things when it comes to the dream uh, as such. So because the uh, uh, input by the aminergic and cholinergic that during wake, you know, that plays a very uh, important role so, uh, so that uh, the, uh, there will be a comparison of, or the online comparison that what is happening or in the real time comparison that is what is happening from the, uh, the external input that is coming up, okay, that is compared and, I, uh, uh, and we come to the conclusion, right, okay, so it is not about a hallucination. But when it, during REM sleep, when this particular capability of the, uh, the forebrain, okay, it gets modulated. So whatever the, uh, 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 the input, uh, predominantly by the internal input, right, that comes in form, in form of a uh, dream mentation. So we will be not be in a position to compare in the real time, whether it is through the external input that is coming, right? And so we will be having a dream like hallucination. So now, so we understood that what are the uh, characteristic of REM sleep. So we know that REM sleep EEG will be like that of a wake then you have a uh, hypotonia, which is a hallmark of uh, REM sleep. And also the, uh, we, uh, we have this uh, rapid eye movement. Now, so what are the different, uh, the circuitry that are involved, okay, in bringing about these basic characteristic of you know, the uh, REM sleep. So we know that, so this is a, a lateral pontine tegmentum Okay, and ventrolateral preaqueductal gray is a REM of neurons that is which will uh, uh, which uh, will inhibit you know the uh, REM and SLD and PLC that is sub, uh, sublateral dorsal nucleus and the free cellulose you know, nucleus it is a REM on and these both REM off and REM on again they are mutually inhibitory to each other like the flip flop circuit that uh, we just saw between wake and sleep. So now the, whenever the orexinergic fibers they are very active, right? And when it activates the REM of neurons. So it means that what? So, the, so you just recollect that orexin also plays an important role in maintaining of the wake. At the same time, orexin also activate REM of neurons. So therefore, the uh, activity of the orexin brings about a stable uh, wake state. The extended VLPO, which is, plays a very important role in initiating of the REM sleep, it inhibits the REM of neurons. So whenever there is a REM inhibition of REM of neurons, it activates REM on neurons and the REM sleep is uh, initiated. So extended VLPO, the uh, wake stabilizing orexinergic and the REM on and the REM off, you now they all act in synchrony to bring about the REM sleep and also that of the wake. Now, whenever there is a REM sleep, because of the activation of EV uh, extended VLPO and the activation of REM on neurons, the SLD nucleus that is sublateral dorsal nucleus, okay, which, uh, it will activate the uh, spinal ventral horn. The, or the interneurons and these interneurons in turn it uh, uh, inhibits the uh, motor neuron and it brings about atonia which is one of the hallmark of REM1 neuron uh, sorry REM sleep. On the other hand the precellulous nucleus so it uh, brings about the uh, activates the hippocampus and and in turn it uh, brings about a desynchronized EEG. So desynchronized EEG and the hypotonia or atonia, right, all the hallmark of REM sleep. However, when it comes to the, to try to, trying to understand the basic, uh, the mechanism that is associated with one of the uh, sleep disorders, well, few of the sleep disorders, that whenever there is a, say, degeneration of SLD, that is, that is sublateral dorsal nucleus, the atonia, 
okay, the, that has to be induced during REM sleep is inhibited. It is not there. So which brings about REM behavior you know, disorders. Uh, so where it can induce you know, some of the, uh, the motor behavior okay, during the REM sleep. So where uh, REM behavior disorder, we have a separate you know, session on that. Then whenever there is a degeneration of orexin, so as we saw earlier, right, there will be narcolepsy. And because there will be pathological intrusion of sleep into the wake, especially the REM sleep. So why there will be REM sleep uh, intrusion in narcolepsy? Uh, uh, because uh, whenever there is a degeneration of orexin is because uh, along with uh, making the wake very uh, instable, it also, right, the inhibit the REM off neurons, which will in turn activate REM on neurons. And these REM activity of these REM on neurons will intrude into the wake. And uh, so this is, this slide also tells that, right, there will be de uh, the deactivation of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in, during REM sleep. So which will be responsible for the loss of volition, the what uh, no logic, logic is not followed, you know, during uh, sleep, right? And uh, so, and uh, the analytical part of the ana analytical way of thinking is lost, you know, during the uh, dream state, right? And about which is associated with uh, like memory and self consciousness, right? Uh, all these things. So thus far, that was in brief to tell you about the uh, basic understanding of how sleep, the physiology that is associated with how the sleep is scored and, and the various, uh, the basic uh, components of uh, REM sleep. So, however, the other things that are also involved in generating of the sleep or which are tightly linked is the core body temperature. So whenever the core body temperature goes down, right? then we get into a sleep mode. So, so, do, so here we can see that, so whenever the core body temperature starts uh, reducing, so our sleep induction, you know, it uh, starts. Now this, uh, uh, the reduction in the core body temperature, okay, which is, uh, 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 which brings about a decrease in the heat production and with uh, increase in the heat loss and which promote the sleep onset and the sleep uh, maintenance. And not only this, the reduction in this core body temperature. So we can see uh, what uh, we can see that it is also associated with uh, increase in the slow wave activity. So therefore, if you look at the whole the circadian behavior of the core body temperature, in the second half of the night, as the REM sleep increases or in the early in the morning, right? So as this graph C, we can see that core body temperature, you know, it gradually start, it's, uh, starts increasing. So increasing in the core body temperature, which is a circadian dependent, right? So it is preparing the whole of our physiological system for, for us to face the subsequent day activity. Otherwise, the decrease in the core body temperature is also associated with increase in the slow wave activity or in the uh, generation of the slow wave activity, which is again the one of the hallmark of the sleep stage that is especially with the deep sleep state. Now, what happens with the normal aging process? With the normal aging process, because of the alterations of the, uh, you know, the circadian physiology, and when this uh, core body temperature uh, decrease, okay, uh, or the reduction of the core body temperature uh, is not uh, adequate or is not attained. So there will be a changes in the sleep as well. So that is the reason why. So there will be a lot of disturbances in the sleep, even if, uh, in the healthy, you know, the um, uh, geriatric age group or that of the old age group, or sometimes when the core body temperature, you know, it increases, so it can induce into the intermittent, you know, the awakenings, or it can disturb the different uh, continuity of the sleep or that of the sleep stages, especially with the sleep onset insomnia. 
Now, what is sleep onset insomnia is that a person goes to sleep, say in his routine time, say at 10:30 or 11 o'clock. He he doesn't get the sleep at all, right? It will take say around uh, say one hour or two hours for him to get into sleep. Otherwise, the sleep onset latency normally it will be around say 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes, we go to bed, switch off the light, so we become drowsy and and then we we fall into the sleep. So if the core body temperature doesn't come down or it takes a longer period of time when to reduce the core body temperature, the sleep onset latency also increases. So this is called a sleep onset insomnia. So it will be a person, it will be very difficult for a person to initiate the sleep. Therefore, one of the, uh, the measure that is advised, especially with the old age is before going to sleep is to dip their uh, you know the forearm and the their leg so in a comfortable uh, hot water for for say half an hour or uh, before going to sleep because of this there will be vasodilatation and because of the vasodilatation there will be dissipation of temperature from the body and this can induce a dip in the uh, core body temperature and it can induce the sleep so studies have shown that such measure can reduce the sleep onset latency and the person can get into the sleep. So that is to say that both the core body temperature and the sleep, now they are tightly linked to each other. Apart from core body temperature and the sleep, the various hormones are also tightly linked to the sleep, especially with the growth hormone, a prolactin, melatonin and cortisol. Now, according to normally, the growth hormone surge you know, it happened just prior, prior to the slow wave sleep uh, in the initial half of the uh, sleep. And this surge in the growth hormone, right, plays a very important role in inducing the anabolic state in the physiological system and to maintain the uh, uh, sleep. The further, so there is also the, uh, the circadian variation with ACTH also where there will be initially there will be decrease in the initial phase of the sleep and subsequently you know in the last phase of the sleep it also increases where this uh, uh, behavior with the decrease in ACTH and the increase in uh, ACTH with the initial and the last phase of the sleep is also associated with the corresponding variations in the cortisol and also melatonin as we know it plays a very important role where the peak of the melatonin somewhere it will be after midnight or in the second half of the uh, second half of the night, and where it uh, it uh, it is also a hypnotic, right? And it is anti-aging, and uh, and uh, it is an antioxidant. So you take any uh, good uh, psychophysiological you know, benefits, right? Melatonin plays a very very important role. So all these circadian variations of these hormones, they're also linked to the different phases of uh, sleep. Then, of course, then of course, uh, uh, the cortisol, you know, it also plays a very important role where uh, the cortisol is very less in the first half of the night and it peaks up in the second half of the night and where it prepares the whole system uh, where because of the anabolic state which is induced by the growth hormone, gradually there will be transition from anabolic to the catabolic you know, state from the cortisol and it prepares the whole system for the subsequent day activity. So this, uh, this cortisol surge right in the early in the morning is a normal physiological rhythm that happens. But sometimes because of the various other factors, it can be including the alterations in the uh, circadian rhythm or it can be stress induced or, it, or if a person has a very less uh, coping skills of the stress, right? These intermittent cortisol surge that can happen, okay, uh, uh, throughout the night because of various uh, psychological factors, again, in turn, this will bring about a instability in sleep, which can induce the intermittent awakenings via the activating of the autonomic, uh, you know, the activity. So the cortisol of here also plays a very important role. But this early morning surge in cortisol, okay, which is uh, seen, this is very, very important and which, which will give an index about, uh, of about the sleep quality also. 
so uh, so early morning surge in the cortisol is a normal physiological you know uh, phenomena so uh, that can uh, that uh, that is found and and the the amount of cortisol surge in the early morning will indirectly gives us information how was our sleep quality in the previous night now all these things whether it is the the uh, neuronal oscillations or whether it is the hormonal variations and it and not only that uh, as uh, briefly it was mentioned it is also associated with, uh, with the temperature and also with our behavior so we know that feeding behavior food behavior all those things are also associated with the sleep now all these things right it is been regulated or the uh, controlled with dmh that is uh, the hypothalamic group dorsal medial hypothalamic group where the integration of all the uh, the circadian the information hormonal information right and all uh, the homeostatic information everything gets integrated in the this hypothalamus so hypothalamus also plays a very important role in bringing about the sleep apart from that sleep also sleep and the sleep induced uh, variations okay in the hormones plays an important role in the immune adaptation also because this understanding this is much more vital in the area of you know the pandemic that we have uh, faced now so why this is very important is that we know that whenever there is a sleep deprivation it's our experience right we are more susceptible for some infections a small infection that can happen now the anabolic state that is created because of the initial slow wave sleep or the deep sleep in the initial phases of the uh, night because of the surge in the you now the growth hormone or that of the prolactin and uh, and the reduction in the cortisol right so it 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 it, uh, it prunes right the uh, the antigen presenting uh, cells to create the antibodies so subsequently you now these antibodies are created and and it is released into the circulation so the pruning of the antigen presenting uh, cells with the th1 specific uh, uh, with the uh, cytotoxic you know the t cells and in the production of the b cells so it all depends on the uh, our uh, initial phases of our sleep that is of uh, which is predominated by the slow wave sleep so therefore the maintenance of the slow wave sleep right or the entry sleep stage plays a very very important role in you know in various uh, factors so suppose if there is sleep disturbance so now if you have a sleep disturbance for the various uh, uh, for the uh, multiple factors or if there is a sleep loss what happens that there is an increase in the epinephrine okay and the norepinephrine which is stimulated because of the stress right in turn uh, uh, what uh, this will uh, stimulate the uh, leukocyte antigenic uh, what uh, receptors yeah, again it activates the uh, the a new nuclear factor kappa uh, beta and it uh, increase uh, it uh, uh, increases the expression of the uh, pro inflammatory cytokines and this in turn which increases the uh, cytokines of interleukin 6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha and this in turn right it can also disturb sleep so the role of cytokines even the earlier uh, i told that it plays a very important role in the, in inducing the sleep yes but if the same cytokines level if the concentration of the cytokine levels right it goes beyond to certain physiological limit it is also detrimental to sleep so therefore the disturbed sleep a chronic sleep deprivation right uh, it uh, it is one of the triggering factor to increase you know the peripheral or the circulatory cytokines and when these cytokines So uh, is beyond the optimal level in the general circulation, right? In turn, it can disturb the sleep also. This is so sleep disturbance and the pro-inflammatory, you know, response is a vicious cycle that plays a very important role. Therefore, having a adequate sleep or the optimal sleep plays a very very important role. And also, uh, so earlier as it was mentioned that uh, even though the CSF fluctuations 
uh, is also associated associated with even though for a very mild way for our respiratory cycle but it is during the slow wave sleep or the or or the slow wave generation right there will uh, be the significant amount of flux of the csf right that happens where it will clear the all the the metabolites so the clearance of tau proteins beta amyloid that gets accumulated right as a uh, uh, the because of our you now the day activity right it has to be uh, it has to be drained out for which the slow wave activity uh, plays a very very important role and we know that as i showed you earlier that because in this slow wave activity there is also increase in the interstitial space and this interstitial space will bring about a, a fluxing of the csf and the draining of this uh, based products and uh, which plays a very also very important role right in retaining of the memory so however otherwise right when these uh, uh, accumulation of these tau proteins or beta amyloid takes place we know that it is one of the risk for the memory related uh, neuropsychiatric uh, no, disorders uh, including like alzheimers and various other conditions so that is to say that please uh, sleep okay it plays a very very uh, important role the other things also when it comes to sleep is the autonomic activity during sleep where uh, the heart rate you know during the sleep no doubt it reduces but the uh, any heart rate during sleep if it is uh, sustained for more than 90 per minutes so it is termed as tachycardia during sleep and if it is less than 40 minutes uh, 40 per minute it is called as bradycardia you know during uh, sleep similarly okay there there should be reduction in the uh, blood pressure during uh, sleep but so reduction in the uh, blood pressure during the sleep okay it should be the fall of the blood pressure should be more than the uh, the 10% of the you know average uh, wake uh, uh, bp uh, uh, value so so these uh, people where there will be dip of the blood pressure during sleep they are called as dippers so this dipping is very very important to maintain the all the uh, the physiological or the psychophysiological benefits of having a quality uh, sleep so so dipping is very very important suppose for any of the reasons if if there are the people you know it can be classified as dippers or non dippers the non dippers are those people where the dipping of the blood pre, uh, blood pressure during sleep doesn't occur or the dipping is less than you know the 10% of their wake value and these non dippers right is known to having a higher risk in handling the you know the uh, the electrolyte handling and uh, with the uh, sodium levels and there will be impairment in the nocturnal sympathovagal balance there will be increase in the nocturnal sympathetic activity and increase in the nocturnal sympathetic activity is known to be a risk for all the development of all this metabolic uh, syndromes right including uh, like uh, disturbed sleep renal disease hypertension okay with um, uh, all these things so so this to give in uh, brief to tell to tell about that the, uh, the both nrem sleep and and rem sleep you have a very specific circuitry that is uh, involved and the circuitry are in very well balanced uh, normally so that the one behavior state you know it's sustained at any given point of time and uh, uh, and uh, the in either whether it is in nrem sleep or with that of a rem sleep so there will be a good interaction between the central network and also with that of the peripheral network so that the homeostasis okay during sleep is maintained any alterations or any deviations so in this uh, the feedback uh, uh, the circuits to maintain the the normal the specific sleep state associated physiological parameter uh, mm-hmm. will, uh, will bring about the risk factors so okay for various uh, disorders 
so and uh, this can be because of the normal age associated process or maybe because of the faulty lifestyle or maybe because of the sleep restrictions or because of a sleep uh, you know the deprivation so with this so uh, so this is just to give the summary of uh, what is the difference between nrem sleep and the uh, rem sleep uh, where uh, the most of the activity during nrem sleep right will be anabolic state uh, and in the rem sleep right it will be more uh, active or it will be more uh, catabolic uh, state so thank you very much is in brief to give you about the neurophysiology or the physiology that is associated with various sleep or the sleep disorders so we have a few couple of questions so there is one question uh, what is the correlation between the food in food intake change and in the core body temperature and sleep quality so uh, as such the uh, the uh, with the circadian variations in the core body temperature so we can have a very small dip in the core body temperature in the afternoon so that is that is one of the reason why uh, most of us we feel very drowsy uh, irrespective of the type of food or the amount of food in the noon however the food intake is also associated with the drowsiness because some of the studies have shown that the depending on the type of food right uh, the food intake it uh, increases the cytokines and which can bring about the sleep uh, or the drowsiness which is associated with the uh, food intake so sleep deprivation and sleep disturbance will be a risk factor for dementia as they affect memory yes the chronic sleep deprivation or the sleep uh, sleep disturbance definitely it, uh, it can uh, it is a risk factor for the memory uh, impairment and also a risk factor for the development of uh, or it is associated with the dementia can you explain how the reciprocal inhibition of wake and sleep centers are affected in parasomnia especially in somnambulism so we have a separate uh, you know ses uh, session on this uh, rem behavior disorder and parasomnia so we can wait for that particular session so okay, so i think uh, yeah there is no any more questions <coughs> 